Today we're going to look at some of the issues that are troubling our society and issues that are troubling us personally. And these issues, these problems lead us to getting into trouble. They can be financial trouble. They can be health troubles, mental troubles, legal troubles. But first let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts, so that we can hear your word. So that your word comes into us and changes our hearts and minds according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we find ourselves sometimes oftentimes in trouble, in troubling situations. And we often think when we get into these problems, when we find ourselves in troubling situations, when we look back, we think to ourselves, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? When a young person, an adolescent, or even a grown man or woman finds themselves sitting in jail or sitting in a treatment center, they may think to themselves, how did I get here? And the mind that is clouded and deceived by nefarious and criminal aspirations, they will also reflect on how did I get here? but they will examine their steps to see how they got caught. How did they make a mistake and end up getting caught and end up in jail? And the same may be the case for the individual who is in a treatment center. They will think to themselves, how did I get here? I will, I've heard individuals with a mindset to blame the system for their bad choices. They blame the drug test. They blame the manager and the job for picking a bad time to give them a test. The criminal will blame the cameras, the surveillance systems. If they didn't have that camera system across the street, I wouldn't have gotten caught. If they would not have gotten a video of me coming out of a building, that I broken into, then I would not have been caught. Or if I would have paid cash for the hotel room, then my wife or my husband would not have known of my affair. It was the credit card's fault. Or if society wouldn't have these draconian laws, these outdated laws against drug use, then my life would be fine. I wouldn't be in this trouble. But nonetheless, many individuals find themselves in a place of either incarceration or counseling. Because our society provides individuals with a second chance. Our society provides individuals with an opportunity to recover from situations. Because it is not an ideal situation to be locked up in jail. It is not an ideal situation to be addicted to drugs, sex, or any other thing. It is not ideal to be suffering from depression, to be suffering from an unhappiness and a sense of unfulfillment. It is not ideal to live in a state of fear and anxiety and then to perform and behave from a mindset of this fear and anxiety. Many of our youths and adolescents are behaving and performing because of peer pressure and pressure from the trends in popular culture, from the pressures of trying to fit into this pop culture society. 
into a society that has lost its way. And I say a society that has lost its way because if we come and look at society, our society from a Christian perspective, from a biblical perspective, if we look at the issues with marriage, with pregnancy, and the ability of children to be born, with the new family structure of single parent homes and blended homes, this is the new family structure. And then our society is bringing in the legalization of drugs, drugs that have been tested and proven to alter the mental and neurological development of a young brain. So our young people are growing up in this environment, an environment full of stressors and pressures coming from every facet of life. And individuals find themselves in trouble. And we find ourselves in places where we can receive help. We find ourselves in places where we can receive counseling. And in the case of drug addiction, <clears throat> after the person goes through the rigors of detoxification, the rigors of alleviating the physical dependency of the drug, the next phase of treatment is counseling. And this is a part of the rehabilitation. Receiving counseling. And this is the purpose or the original purpose of incarceration. It was to be a sort of rehabilitation. The word penitentiary has the root word penitence, which means penance. It was to be a place for someone to be sorrowful for one's sins or their faults. So the goal of a penitentiary is To be a place where someone goes or where someone is placed so that they can be reflective and sorrowful for their sins and faults. But in today's society, these places of incarceration are no longer looked at or considered to be penitentiaries. These places are simply prisons. These places are simply buildings of confinement and captivity. There is no longer a focus on rehabilitation in these places. And currently the legislative winds are blowing in such a way as to release these individuals back into society. Because society realizes that these places are in fact only institutions of confinement and captivity. Since God is removed from society, and as such, we have to remove the concept of sin, then we can no longer call these places penitentiaries. These are no longer places where people can be sorrowful for their sins and faults. Now they are only places of captivity and confinement. And since society recognizes that they are confining individuals and capturing them, they see now to release these individuals. It is no longer tolerable to place people in cages, to have laws that capture individuals and confine them with no purpose. And so the laws change, legalization, and society now at the local and state levels the legislatures are promoting the legalizations of all types of behaviors that were previously considered crimes. And this is due in part because there is no rehabilitation process or a standard of righteousness that will provide focus and direction for the rehabilitation of individuals in society. It is basically do whatever you want to do just don't get caught. <clears throat> and if you get caught, we can only give you a ticket. 
because there is no moral standing or grounds for us to capture or confine an individual that has inherent freedom. A freedom to pursue happiness in whatever manner they see fit. <clears throat> But before this wave of new thinking and new legal approaches to dealing with the problems in society, before this wave passes over the entire American countryside, we still have centers and places where people receive counseling for the things that have troubled their lives. And some of these counseling centers are secularly oriented. And these secularly oriented centers will eventually go the way as I have previously described. They will eventually go away. They will disappear because they have no moral framework. They have no standard of righteousness. As the Supreme Court has redefined marriage, and marriage is now whatever an individual or two individual individuals who love each other choose it to be. And this will eventually come to two or more individuals, whatever they choose to be. But when an individual enters into a counseling session, when they enter into the rehabilitation process, they are counseled and taught to have and develop different habits. This is what the word rehabilitation means. When a house goes into rehab, it is the process of bringing the house back to its original form, an original form where it is habitable. <clears throat> a dilapidated structure, which is unsafe for an individual to live or do business, it is made habitable by going through the rehab process. So individuals are shown in these counseling sessions the areas where they have made bad decisions and use erroneous methods of thinking and where they have behaved badly. They are shown these things to bring them out of a state of dilapidation and to bring them into a state of being habitable. If we take a look at Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 12, it says, <clears throat> And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And if we look at the addictions and behaviors that the laws of society have deemed necessary for incarceration and many other sinful behaviors from a Christian perspective, we see that that, that mindset behind these behaviors places an individual into bondage into incarceration or into having to spend time in a rehabilitation center. That first hit of a drug is a trap. The peer pressure and societal pressure from popular cultural trends are the bait. These things are the bait that lures an individual to fall into the trap to place oneself into the bondage of addiction or the bondage of theft or criminal activity or the bondage of sexual immorality, disease, mental anguish, and depression. All of these things are spurred by loveless interactions with individuals, relationships that are based on animal desires, lacking any covenant, and we see these results of loveless relationships wandering the streets of every city. The stray dogs and cats born out of the heat of animal desire and passion. These stray animals wander the streets with no direction or purpose other than to fulfill their animal desires. 
and it is common veterinary advice for owners of dogs and cats to spay and neuter them. Our environment would be better managed if these animals' reproductive behaviors and desires were controlled by well-meaning men and women. But the stray animals who have no master or owner, they wander the streets and their progenity, the natural result of animal desires and passion, also wander aimlessly in the streets of our cities. Their carcasses, run over by vehicles and trucks, often litter and decompose in our streets. This is the result that can be clearly seen of the engaging in sexual passions without any regard to covenant or good sense. <clears throat> it is an environment of sickly and ill, malnourished, malformed, maladjusted, and angry animals without a master or owner, wandering the environment, wreaking havoc, destroying structures, tearing through garbage bags, and living off the refuse of society only to end up as a carcass mutilated and destroyed, aborted in the streets of our cities. We can clearly see this in the stray dogs and cats that wander aimlessly in our streets and communities. And I often say to myself, when I see a beautiful breed of dog with a wonderful and colorful coat and beautiful eyes and a tail that is wagging, I say to myself, where is this animal's master? Where is this animal's owner? Why is this animal wandering aimlessly in the street? It has so much potential. And as this animal darts in and out of traffic, automobiles blow their horn, I think again, where is this animal's master? But then this animal has no master. This animal has no owner. An owner who will love it, protect it, take care of it, and guide it. But this animal is free to do as it pleases, to come and go as it wills. And this is also a freedom that we all oftentimes hope and desire for, to come and go as we please, to do as I will. And then along my drive, I pass a place that is called a rescue shelter. This is a rescue shelter for animals. And the animals that are in this rescue shelter, they have been rescued from terrible situations. And once these animals come into the rescue shelter, they begin the process of rehabilitation. The men and women who run these rescue shelters, they care for these animals. They provide for these animals. They protect and provide shelter for these dogs and cats and other animals. The verse of scripture that we stopped on was Colossians chapter 1 verse 12. And again it says, And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> in verse 13, it says, For he, the Father, has rescued us. It is the Father who has rescued us from a situation that is very similar to the situation I described with the stray animals. The Father has rescued us from wandering aimlessly in the streets of this world. Wandering aimlessly in the highways and byways of this world. And it also tells us what we were rescued from. We were rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the Son He loves. So the rescue process, the rehabilitation process, is bringing individuals out of the dominion of darkness and bringing them into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. 
This is very similar to the rescue of these stray animals who are out in the streets, who are involved in other dangerous and abusive situations. And once these animals are rescued, the process of rehabilitation occurs. They are cared for, they are protected, they are given shelter. And then the word of God says, and then they are brought into the kingdom of the son he loves. The goal of the rescue shelter is, and this is the long-term goal, to find these animals who were wandering aimlessly and running stray, to find these animals a home, to find these animals an owner, an owner who will love them, protect them, and give them shelter. And from a Christian perspective, this is our God. And we enter into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the son he loves. And this is where we will find love, shelter, and protection. From the places we have been, from the things that we have done, and from the people and entities that we have aligned ourselves with, the dark forces that we have promoted in our lives. But the thing that I want to focus on now is the counseling session. The activity and the information that is given to an individual who enters into the process of counseling. What happens in this counseling, this rehabilitation session? What is an individual taught? What life lessons are they given? And this will happen in a secular environment or with a Christian counseling session. If an individual is being counseled on their problems with theft, with stealing, with criminal activity. And this applies across the board to many of the problems and troubles that individuals get themselves into. The counselor will approach these issues with a service learning approach. It's called community service. Service learning is a form of experiential education where learning occurs through a cycle of action and reflection as students work with others through a process of applying what they are learning to community problems and at the same time reflecting upon their experience as they seek to achieve real objectives for the community and a deeper understanding for themselves. So when a person enters into service learning, into community service, it is oriented for the person in rehab to help others. And the people that they are helping are people just like them. And so they can see it from another perspective. They can see themselves receiving help. They can see themselves being the one who needs help. They can see themselves being the one that does damage to the community. And then when they reflect on these things, that experience will teach them the error of, them, of their ways. And if the individual who is counseled through this service learning approach, if he or she learns the lessons of service, if they reflect on that experience of helping others, if this approach is properly and effectively instituted, the individual receiving this counseling and this training, after they reflect on their previous behaviors, they will come to see the wrongness that was in their previous behaviors, the wrongness that is in stealing, the wrongness that is in the drug abuse, culture and community, the wrongness that is in the sexual immorality culture and communities. Because all of these activities and behaviors, they have their adherence. They have those who follow and also participate in these activities. They become a community. 
the people who engage in these activities. They support one another, the dealers and the users, the panderers and the ones being offered for sale. They support each other. They encourage each other. So these people form a community, a community that is existing in darkness and depravity. And the service learning approach shows that these dark communities are a danger and a source of destruction for the communities of righteousness and light. They bring a sickness to the healthy communities, to healthy living. And through the service learning process, individuals begin to see the error in how they used to live, in the choices that they used to make, whether it was a crime or personal abuse, where they made, made choices that hurt themselves or hurt their family members, or they contributed to the hurt that is present in their communities. The choices that they made that contributed to the darkness that is in the community. To the children who are growing up without a mother or without a father, without someone loving them, protecting them, and giving them shelter. So in counseling, through a service learning approach or any other counseling approach, be it verbal training and teaching or Christian counseling, people learn to see the bigger picture. People learn to see the error of their ways. And after an individual goes through a successful counseling session and process, they are better off. They are more productive members of the community and they have a better peace of mind and joy for themselves. But the question is this, does a person's life have to come to this drastic point? Do men and women have to come to the point where others and society at large have to step in and rescue them? Do men and women have to be physically captured and contained in order for society at large to help them stop hurting themselves and stop hurting others within the community? Because in Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now after the service learning or the counseling session, after the rehabilitation process, a person who successfully completes these processes and continues to carry out what they have learned in their lives these individuals are said to be wise. They are wiser for having gone through this process, this counseling process, this rehabilitation process. But brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you today that we do not have to go through these extreme processes. We do not have to go through rehabilitation. We do not have to go through this counseling with others. We do not have to go through the penitentiary process. We do not have to go through these extreme processes. If we read, understand, and follow the words that are written here in Proverbs 9 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Anything an individual learns after They've gone through the rehab process after they have gone through a counseling session. Anything that they have learned and that will benefit them has already been given in the word of God. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were given the Ten Commandments and also 600 other commandments, instructions, and directions on how to live in society and how a society or community should function. In Galatians chapter 5, a basic outline on personal behavior is given. 
And this is for my New Testament Christians. In verse 19 of Galatians chapter 5, it says this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. In any counseling session or rehabilitation process, a person is trained and taught that sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like is wrong and bad for the community. These activities, and you can pick whichever one that you are being counseled for or being rehabilitated for, or you can pick more than one. Because many of us have had problems with three or more of these issues. If you have entered into counseling, if you have had to go to rehab, if you have had to go to a doctor or a psychologist because of your stress, your depressions, And these stresses and depressions that are probably most likely related to one or more of these issues that are present in your life or in your relationships with other people. You are going to learn in the counseling sessions. You are going to learn in the rehabilitation process that you should avoid these activities. You are going to learn that you should avoid sexual immorality. You are going to learn that you should avoid jealousy. You are going to learn that you should avoid fits of rage and anger. You are going to learn that you should avoid drunkenness. You're going to learn to avoid selfish ambition. You're going to learn to avoid hatred, discord, and dissensions. You're going to learn to avoid being envious. All of these things you're going to learn after the fact. If you are successful in the counseling or the rehabilitation process or the penitentiary process, if you have to go to prison to learn your lesson, what are you going to learn? The lesson that you are going to learn has been here in the Word of God for over 3,000 years. And the entire Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament has been with us for almost 2,000 years. And each one of us who are suffering with these problems currently or who have gone through a rehabilitation process or who has went through a counseling session or has been through the prison reform process, all of us who have been through these processes or currently need help with these issues that we are facing. We have been exposed at one time or another to the word of God in some form. We may have had Bibles in our houses growing up. Or we may have seen a preacher on TV or heard one on the radio. We may have seen a, in a movie a preacher or a church service. So in one form or another, we have been aware that there are churches and there are and there is a Bible. Many of us have grown up in homes where parents, either a mother or a father, has brought us to a church service. So we have been exposed to the word of God. But the problem is we did not follow it. The problem occurs because we were not serious about the word of God. That these words that are in the Bible have come, in fact, from the creator of the universe. And that these words coming from God, that these words coming from the creator, our creator, that these words may in fact be important that maybe we should pay attention to these words.
The same lessons and instructions, the commands that are given by God to us in this world, these are the same lessons that we will learn if we have to go through the rehab process, if we have to go through the prison rehabilitation process, if we have to go through a counseling process. If we have to go through these processes because we have gotten ourselves into trouble, what will we learn after we go through these processes? We are going to learn nothing more than what God has already told us in his word. And so when we go to Proverbs 9 verse 10 and it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now when we read this verse, its importance and divine nature will often escape from us. What is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But now that I reflect over my life, now that I am a Christian and one who in fact fears the Lord, and now the decisions that I make in my life, I see that these decisions are wise. They stand the test of time. They prove to be wise decision during the times of recession and during the times of opportunity. My decisions now that I am a Christian and I respect, honor, and fear the Lord, the decisions that I make are wise in sick times and in healthy times. When viruses are raging through society, when communicable diseases are catching the unwary and scarring them for life, placing individuals in bondage, in bondages to have to take medicine, to have to have the money for pills so that the disease that they contracted will not infect others and not continue to destroy the, their quality of life. Their lives now are in bondage to a pill, to have to go out and get money to buy a pill because they contracted a disease through engaging in certain behaviors. So my decisions based simply on the fear of the Lord has provided me protection from these things, has kept me healthy and kept me out of all sorts of bondages. But I have also come to this wisdom after the fact. I have come to fear the Lord after I was rescued. I have come to fear and respect the Lord after being in the bondage of the kingdom of darkness, after wandering the streets aimlessly. And in my mind, I no longer had a master. I could do as I pleased. I could do as I willed. And after my counseling session, after my rehabilitation process, after my prison reform process, after I went through the processes, then I learned to be wise. The process taught me the life lessons that I needed to learn in order to be wise. But the word of God right here in Proverbs 9 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The word of God tells us that we do not have to go through the process, that we do not have to go through the pain, the loss, the trouble, the prison, the addiction, the broken marriage, if only we fear the Lord. Because it is the fear and respect of the Lord and respect and fear of his word that is the beginning of wisdom. And many of us have come to be wise after the fact, after we have gone through a process, after we have gone through a situation, after we have gone through an addiction, after we have gone to prison, after we have destroyed a marriage, after we have destroyed someone's trust, after we have hurt a family member. It is always after that we have learned our lesson or become wise. It is always after we have spent our money foolishly. 
It is, only, it is only after we have messed up our credit and had to go through the trouble of rebuilding a good credit history and making better decisions. It is always after that we become wise. But the word of God tells us how to become wise in the beginning. How to start with wisdom, how to start making better decisions, how to start living a better life, how to start being financially responsible, how to start being responsible in our relationships with others, how to start being a good husband or a good wife. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but this life on earth is short. I realize now, after the fact, that our time on this earth is very short. There are so many things that I wish I would have done in my youth. I would have been so further ahead in, in life if I would have made better decisions back then, in the beginning. Because getting out of trouble takes up so much of your time. And these counselors and counseling sessions are expensive. They consume valuable resources. They require money that could be better spent in other areas. They take up our time that could have been used in a more effective and productive manner. If only we had, in the beginning, made a wise decision. If we had only, in the beginning, had a fear and respect for God and the Word of God. Because the only thing that we prove, that we learn, that we affirm after the fact, the only thing that we learn after is that God was telling the truth in the beginning. But for so many of us, we only come to this wisdom after when we always had it or could have had it or could have operated on it in the beginning. And I pray that we are able to hear this word of the Lord. May this word of the Lord come into us and change our hearts and minds according to the will of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.